What is up, y'all? It's your boy Aniki coming at you with another video for One Piece chapter 1032. Here's the review Odin's Beloved Blade. What can I say? But for those of you who have not read, a dupe. Let's get into the chapter page by page breakdown. You already know how we do. Uh, this was a chapter that I know a lot of people needed because a lot of people uh, have kind of been denying some things, but we'll, we'll get into that. So interestingly enough, we get a random shot of Marco taking Izo somewhere. So we understand that he met up with Marco and they decided to strategize about Kazenbo, the fire rage of the Koz Kozuki spirit that uh, Kanjuro painted in his last moments. Um, we see that Samurai are basically... What's interesting about this raid is that now that the building is on fire, the military tactic has shifted from we don't have to actually beat the beast pirates to to win or take out the majority of your forces now we can now circumvent this entirely by just maintaining the exits and forcing everybody to stay within this dangerous zone that is on fire burning with weapons explosives everywhere else so just an excellent uh highlight of the military strategy changing on the fly to adjust the battlefield properly where escape is more important than holding the castle due to the circumstances surrounding it. Now, we see that uh, DS Drake and Apu are still going at it following Yamato and Fuga, establishing that like Yamato and Fuga have definitely been friends. Uh, the whole, this is Ushimaru Zoro's dad theory, I'm not really jumping on board with that right now. Uh, could it be? Sure, but I'm not gonna throw too much into that yet. It could just easily be that Oda was just using similar designs because we don't know. If we knew more about when the ancient giant experiments were conducted on Punk Hazard and where they got the people that they decided to use for it, that would tell us a lot more. For example, if around the time that that devil fruit that was considered a failure was made, that was also around one of the times that Kaido had been captured. If he had been grabbed and experimented on and having some of his DNA taken and then, you know, having some of that used to be not only applied to his dragon devil fruit from that lineage factor, but also then utilizing his own genetics and applying that to different people and then also utilizing that to be spliced with ancient giant genetics as a way to bridge the generations between the species. Especially because Onigashima, I am one of the believers that that's Spore is the first skull and it's basically his dead body and really I think Oris the second might have been his, uh, was more of his son, but he might have been the one that was actually pulling the continents when he realized that like he's so tall that he could for all we know have been originally like standing there and just died that way. We don't know exactly what's going on or maybe secretly all the islands of Wano are part of his corpse. That could be an interesting take. Anyway, just other things to give, but that's irrelevant to the fact that we, we don't know exactly when the numbers were acquired. We just know that they were acquired from Punk Hazard. And that might, and if they did go there for that, then it could be assumed that Caesar is the one who found them and gave them to Kaido, which means that that's a very recent acquisition. And that might even explain why Big Mom hadn't run into the numbers yet. And just more of it was like, oh, these are the things that he got from Punk Hazard. So it could be that when Caesar was on the island and they took over. So after the duel between the uh, Aokiji and the Kainu. So that could actually indicate that the numbers have only been in the Beast Pirates for about a year to two years at most, looking more like a year. And so that might explain why three of the numbers were sitting there with the poo. And if they were experiments from people who were uh, like left on Punk Hazard after being mutilated and experimented on and they were prisoners from Wano, that would mean likely that they were prisoners on Kaido's ship when he lost some battle back in the day and was captured and taken to Punk Hazard and experimented on. So that would have to be the chain of events is that like around the time that we saw the flashback with them breaking out that he like took them as prisoners wet as he got captured and taken to Punk Hazard. Especially since those wouldn't be citizens of the world government it though it would be even more justified in using these humans as random experiments if they were adults that they tried this on so uh but we do see that brooke and robin as they've been fleeing uh the giant fire ghoul end up landing on top of fuga's hair 
uh, CP0 in Hot Pursuit does end up getting lit on fire by the Spectre. It's clear here that they were obviously using like uh, hardening just to make sure they or armament high could endure the flames then when they hit the ground and Apu is running up we, we kind of see that like everybody's like invested in this fight as like Yamato is running past you can see Kazunbo she's worried about him potentially going down to the basement and obviously and causing an explosion after all that's where she's been going to try to remove all the uh explosives before the island of detonating I've seen some people suggest that perhaps Yamato dying in this field of explosives trying to protect everyone is going to be the tragedy of act three and that way Yamato doesn't get to go on the crew and potentially accidentally spoil Luffy on anything about what's coming next or anything like that because Yamato is a character that knows the true history now one of the things that I was kind of talking about I think it was over in BDA and was kind of discussing how I think that a lot of the worst generation could end up at that 1 billion mark due to the events of this arc. And this conflict right here kind of leads into that even more because you have two members of CP0 having been photographed by Apu and then effectively blackmailed with Apu effect straight up saying he's going to, you know, be giving the photos to Morgans. He's going to sell them to Morgans for the, that scoop so that he can expose that the world government was directly trading with Kaido through um, its effectively its CIA, its agents and representatives, then effectively, even if he does not get to sell these pictures to Morgans, the fact that he has access to this information and if he would have survived this interaction, and as we see, he's partnering up with Diaz Drake to fight CP0 here, where they might be taking out two of the Celestial Dragons direct spies and agents. They're taking out extremely high political officers here. Um, obviously, you know, back then, they only got like a couple, two, three hundred million increases for doing this kind of stuff. But this is an arc where they will effectively be lumped up with the efforts of Law, Luffy, and Kid, where Law and Luffy are known to have an alliance. So they, it would be revealed that Law, Luffy was coordinating with Law after the events of Whole Cake. So then they're going to look at their dynamic differently. And Kid be having joined their alliance after while being in Wano is going to be something that's well documented if we have Apu taking pictures here and there of CP0. There's likely to be images that can be sent to uh, the newspapers of, directly of Law and Kid fighting Big Mom. In fact, the media may themselves strip Big Mom of her title as a Yonko, specifically because they would say, okay, look at this. Your, your, your territory had been raided by several members of the worst generation. Then Luffy actually did succeed as far as the media is concerned. Now, in addition to that, not only did he succeed, you followed him to Wano, and then he's not even the one that dealt with you. It was the other members of the worst generation. Clearly, your time is up, Big Mom. So we got that kind of set up with just all this information. But then in addition to that potential weight and story and spin that the media has out of what can happen during this arc with whenever a character has access to important information, they get a, an increase in bounty with Apu being a powerful pirate with personal information on the world government, effectively with dirt on the celestial dragons themselves you now get a reason for somebody to be brought up to like a billion same with you know they're also taking out these agents same with you know diaz drake especially with him already having been a member of sword and effectively cp0 says here that the reason they're going after him is because loose ends uh inconvenient truths are meant to be erased as, as in they appreciate the stuff that sword is done but because of what's happening in wano right now this move to annex mono is effectively them saying we don't need to necessarily do a deep cover op anymore our man on the inside is irrelevant cp0 you clear clean this up we'll extract you and ds drake will just die here as you know like a pirate who was under the uh beast pirates flag one of the flying six now, the fact that he will also be a pirate that knows the secrets of the world government and knows that they sent CP0 here and is going to be taking these agents out. And then, in addition to that, was a high-ranking member of Kaido's officials and will be escaping, then 
even though like it's likely that Kaido and Big Mom themselves will fall here or lose here and if Kaido himself is caught but you as one of his subordinates escape and you're a former member of the Marines and you took out a CP0 agent and you might be considered to be allied with the Straw Hat Pirates especially because they might have the CP0 was keeping tabs on all the fights so they would have heard him try to ally with Luffy more than likely you have all this setup where they're like effectively in the minds of CP0, if they even if they don't die, if they manage to like kind of run away or send a report as they're dying and things are burning down around them, they're likely to say that the worst generation has formed an alliance. And they might not specify which members. They might say that they knew Apu had teamed up with so-and-so or they're going to say it. But if they see Diaz Drake after having known that he allied with Luffy with uh, Apu here and them teaming up taking out cp0 together and they already know luffy law and kid are here their bounties are going to go up because they're a bunch of captains who were already considered dangerous as super rookies now as far as the media is concerned we're looking at a very likely spin of all of them being affiliated and forming an alliance that took out two of the yonko and we're going to have this idea that the worst generation are literally coming up here to completely remove this era of the emperors and one piece movie red being announced we could be getting this backstory on Shanks in a movie because he's about to get his ass whooped in the manga. Uh, I'm a big believer in Blackbeard taking out the Red Hair Pirates and Luffy not getting to properly have that meeting with Shanks. I personally, like I know a lot of people are really attached to that. I think it would hit a bit harder if Luffy has to come to terms with the fact that in the world of pirates, like your dreams can be denied. and he kind of like you know Sabote and you know Marineford it's like oh yeah but well Ace died at Marineford but Ace like kind of chose to sacrifice himself but like any goal can be off the table anything can be taken from you and while Luffy can be upset with Blackbeard for having beaten Ace and gotten him imprisoned for in a lot of ways for Luffy he said two people and other pirates before well where pirates there is no such thing as fair to a certain degree Blackbeard is the kind of guy Luffy hates but he's just playing the pirate game. And so, a bit more, if you have Blackbeard responsible for the fall of Shanks, if you have Blackbeard responsible for the death of Ace, ultimately, you have these connective threads for Luffy to really be in opposition of him, even though they haven't really gotten to interact that much during the story. Luffy and Blackbeard haven't had a, a substantial amount of interactions. They met in Mock Town. They, and you know, they had those moments where they like kind of got to identify that they're both big dreamers. But this, and then they met in Impel Down when Blackbeard was exploiting what Luffy did and was just being an opportunist. And ultimately, it's like, yeah, I got him thrown in jail, but it's because he pulled up and tried to fight me. I was going to go after you. So. And I think that's also part of what made Luffy even more determined is realizing that Blackbeard was after him and, you know, Ace just happened to end up in that fight, end up, you know, being taken out partially because of that. So, yeah, uh, just a lot to think about with the way that the political storm is building up this arc and what the fallout can be with the media, just with that focus of Apu talking about Morgans. And then we switch over to... Uh, a uh, particularly interesting section of the chapter where we finally get to King and Zoro fighting outside by the skull. We see Momo still under the island trying to generate flame clouds in practice. And, and King starts stretching back his, you know, his, his head and snaps it back like it's a, a rubber band with a long range peck attack. Um, we get Zoro saying that the attack is like a laser blink, a laser beam, and you know he's like, "Oh, how do I block that?" And I don't know if Oda's trolling us or if he's technically saying, "Well, you can't prove I'm wrong, so I'm gonna just kind of roll with this." But King claims that Tyrannodons of the past hunted their prey just like this, with the stretching their heads back and snapping them forward. So it, that's a thing when you remember what what's going on with Sasaki, you realize that Oda's just kind of having fun with the dinosaurs and what their abilities and how they work are, so we're just having some fun with it. Now, Zoro's trying his, you know, flying slashes. It's a similar issue to the Pika problem all over again, where he couldn't reach Pika, didn't have a slash big enough. 
Um, except I don't think that this time is going to be, you know, Zoro getting thrown by some really buff dude so that he can bridge the gap in the distance because, you know, somebody's actually going to be there. Uh, granted, since he's fighting outside, you could argue that the move that Sanji's using on Queen is going to allow them to end up meeting up somehow and then he's going to get a boost from Sanji doing Tactics 5 or something like that. You could take that stance. But I don't think mobility is going to be the focus here, especially because of what's said later. Now, I've seen some interesting interpretations of what happens during this fight, especially with the Tatsumaki scene. And we need to address this because it is not that King is somehow more durable than Kaido. Uh, this isn't. You know, King isn't making Kaido go to, like, his fullest extent. I'm pretty sure that Kaido has fought and defeated almost every single person in his crew specific that is a higher up simply because you can have the right to challenge anyone. So, now, I do want to get into the dialogue a bit because I made it a point to, like, kind of look at multiple translations for One Piece because people really do hate the official One Piece translation, so I try to, like, look at what they're seeing and the verbiage here is really really important though and what he says is like so between the, di the dragon and the dinosaurs you guys soak up damage like nobody's business and then like a lot of scans had king saying that he was on another level but what he says in the officials i think it's important is that true but in my specific case it goes even beyond that as in it goes beyond being a dinosaur or a dragon there's something else at play here now, I'm going to take a stretch to say that what he's effectively saying is that my Lunarian defense, my my race, like, it was Kaido being an Oni made, like, okay, guessing his race versus whether or not, like, that's actually his head and he's a dragon or whatever, where his defense came from, important. In this case, what we might be being told is that the Lunarian defense doesn't come from his, din or his defense doesn't come from his dinosaur aspects, but rather from his Lunarian. And with the dark wings and the ability to control fire, you could, and just sitting atop the red line, you could argue that this is like a gargoyle species that Jenner had flames on its back to create its own heat and strong skin to withstand the winds and all that other stuff way high up on top of the, the red line. And it kind of reminds me of uh, God of High School, which I don't know if it, those of you have read that, but effectively there's the God of Fight in the top. And when he gets into a fight with uh, the Jin Mori, effectively he makes a bunch of clones and the way he beats him is that he gets a slow sliver from a magical staff into him and then makes that thing expand. But the idea was that that guy was, it was hard to do real damage to him because he was the hardest organic matter that could exist within the universe that could be like a living vessel. And that may be what we're getting here with Lunarians where they're, kind of like this extra tough, naturally durable, gargoyle-like species, which is why they have the wings and the flames, and they're just kind of like this real tough, durable uh, species, and that's what he means by it's beyond the dinosaurs and the dragons. It's the fact that I'm a Lunarian. Um, and we get him actually straight up saying, like, I'll give you a sword fight because I do enjoy a good duel, but it's worth noting, it looks like that uh, King does throw a couple punches, while he's swinging his sword um and of course we get the uh the, the the big meme here of course because zoro is you know debating whether he's a fish man or he's got giant blood or he's talking about whatever kind of race he is and we just got to ask ourselves why zoro is always worried about race and why so many of his opponents have certain skin tones because it seems like we're getting a certain message here, especially when we look at Zoro's alternative career choices. Now, we get to what I think is a part of the chapter that a lot of people got upset about, or it turned into like a giant meme bonanza, of course, is that Enma reacted to the Shimasen, and or the Shamisen, the Japanese guitar. Now, the thing about this is that Enma is reacting to, very likely, Komurasaki playing the favorite song of Odin that Hiori would play for him back in the day. The significance of this is just that it means that the Enma, the blade, they talked about how, uh, Kawabansu talks about how 
a, a, soul, a warrior can leave his soul in a weapon or how like that influence and it's worth noting that during the rooftop fights there was a strong emphasis on Enma because this is another thing that needs to be brought up is that that we're not getting that same emphasis on Enma in the panels like when Zoro does his Tatsumaki against Kaido there's one particular slash that appears on his body and in addition to that Enma itself glows a special glow a bonus dark radiance to it when he's doing the pose that it's not present when he does the Hatsumaki in this chapter and what this kind of suggests to me is that Enma because of the nature of the rivalry between Kaido and Odin was especially reactive to fighting Kaido the will of that sword itself was automatically getting more hockey out than Zoro noticed but it was still sustainable but this would also explain part of why he was so gassed after trying to use a uh, flying dragon blaze which led to him getting struck by Indra because at the end of the day Enma was already reacting and pulling more energy out of Zoro than he was supposed to be putting into it Enma overclocking Zoro's ability slightly on the rooftop so that he can you know do more harm to Kaido especially you know he's like I need to use Enma better and Enma in turn was like yeah let's kill Kaido but we're not seeing that same level of pressure and then when Enma hears you know Hiyori who keep in mind Enma was originally given to Hiyori so the will of Odin is that Hiyori inherit the blade of Enma and that's why she was able to bequeath it to Zoro this means that Enma is working with Zoro because Zoro was fighting Kaido he was aligning with the overall goals of the sword the sword chooses its wielder is a thing that's been talked about in one piece uh Sandai Kitetsu has been called especially bloodthirsty uh Shusui was considered to be a bit of a temperament because he's swallowed up the other slashes he's always talked about his swords having their own wills and with Enma especially it's been emphasized that it's got its own will and it's especially being highlighted through the response to different warriors trying to use it where it purposely tries to drain them as much will as possible basically to a certain degree odin like enema is kind of like can you measure up to my master odin are you as good as odin kind of seems to be the case because odin's been able to use enema from what we can understand since he was a child which means either Enma just always worked this way and Odin just was that built different with excellent Ryo from a small young age where he was just able to do what he needed to do and always wield Enma with precision or um, Odin was feeding Enma so much of his energy that it became a greedy blade that pulls you know more hockey out of people because it's supposed it's used to doing more taking more like it's the sword that's supposed to be able to cut through hell so there's definitely been this i just really love the fact that we're finally getting payoff of that you know big mom was saying that it wasn't a normal sword kaido kept saying that that sword was giving off a unique presence and now we see that the sword's own malice is more than likely what was reacting to kaido there and finally we get towards the end of the chapter with Komurasaki and Orochi. Now, Scanlation said that had Komurasaki saying that she would, you know, she, like, it was basically like, till death do us part, or we'll, we, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Whereas this one says, Lord, I'm always by your side. Very different, like, connotations, but ultimately, I think the implication here is that regardless, she's here to kill him. And it may be that Enma is trying to get back to Komurasaki now because Enma wants her to use it to fight and kill Orochi, who is part of the pe one of the people who would be on Odin's hit list and have that animosity that would last past death. Uh, so that's kind of what I think is going on here is that I'm not necessarily saying that Enma will be handed off to Hiyori but it could be a situation where Enma would rather be wielded by Hiyori to kill Orochi than help Zoro fight Kaido. And that's just the situation that I think we're in right now. The sword is just not interested in what Zoro's doing right now, and that creates an entirely new level of mastery and competency that we need to see out of Zoro, while also finally adding more nuance to the sword system because we've had these talks of cursed swords, and you know them having their own wills choosing their own owners and we've yet to see one with this much personality so it's kind of nice to see oda finally delivering on that um, 
hope you guys enjoyed this video on one piece I'm gonna be trying to do more content on the series got some other projects on the way uh let me know what you think down below if you've been enjoying it like and subscribe uh i'm always around for sundays on the church of mha and other stuff so i'm anarchy and i'm out